Now we will take a look at how traffic flows through a proxy device, a firewall, or a network address translation or port address translation device. We'll begin with a very simple scenario where we have a client over here on the left hand side and the client's IP address is 10.57.0.1. This device in the center is a NAT box, so it will do network address translation. We don't want to use our inside address here out on the internet. So this client will be sending the traffic to IP address 83.150.67.33 out on the internet. The traffic will flow down through the TCP IP stack and the network interface driver and then the network interface card itself and this client in this example has MAC address A. The traffic will be sent from MAC address A at the IP address of our client to MAC address B which is the MAC address of the router on this network, the inside network. The destination IP address will be the final target out on the internet. Now when the traffic is handled by this firewall and NATing device, the firewall portion of this box would provide us with filtering rules. So if we don't want certain traffic going from one host to another host or from one port to another port or inbound on a port or anything like that, then the firewall rules would define that. When the traffic is sent outbound, this NATing firewall is set up to use an external address of 130.57.0.1. So it will change the source IP address to 130.57.0.1 and of course it will have replaced the MAC address, putting its own MAC address in as the source and the destination MAC address of the next router along the path. In order for this device to handle traffic coming back in in response to this packet, it has to know exactly what the correlation is between addresses. So it's got to have in its tables something that indicates that traffic going outbound from 130.57.0.1 is actually on the internal side going to be forwarded back to our 10.57.0.1. Now, network address translation offers a great capability, but there are times when companies will have multiple hosts on the inside and they want all those different hosts to communicate outbound over a single address. In that case, we use port address translation. Let's talk about how port address translation would work. In this example, we have a client at IP address 10.57.0.1, just as we did in the last example. When this host communicates, it sends the packet out from its local hardware address to the router's local hardware address. It sends the packet out from its source IP address. But port address translation uses the information in the source port field of the client to demultiplex the traffic coming back. So our client is sending a packet out from source port 1024. We'll see that down here when it's sent to the router, we are still using source port 1024. And when the traffic arrives at the firewall slash PAT or port address translation box, this box is set up to make sure that all outbound traffic uses 130.57.0.1. The traffic will flow outbound and it will come from 130.57.0.1 from this firewall PAT device's hardware address to the next hardware address and it will still keep the same target IP address. But this port address translation box is going to remember the port number used for this particular communication and it will put that information in its tables to say 130.57.0.1 port 1110 is actually correlated to 10.57.0.1 port 1024. So when a response comes in and it's addressed to 130.57.0.1 port 1110 on the inside this PAT device will 
translate that over to 13057.0.1 port 1024. And that's how the response will get back to our client. If we have another client that shows up on the network that now has IP address 10.57.0.2 and it's also using source port 1024, that's no problem. Following the same process, this PAT box will keep track in memory of the information with this new connection. When it talks outbound from the new connection, it will assign a new source port number, 1112 let's say and it will put the information in its tables correlating traffic flowing outbound 13057.0.1 port 1112 is correlated to 1057.0.2 inside on port 1024. So when a response comes back to this first address and port on the inside the PAT device will alter the IP header and change the port number to send the packet back to the originator of the first packet. So it's really important to understand how the communications work in the network because sometimes you'll pick up traffic and you've got to decide if you have to move on the other side of a router to get the MAC address of the target that you you need to get the information for or we also need to sometimes correlate traffic on either side of a PAT device or a NAT device. Now let's take a look at a packet before and after it's gone through a NAT device. We have an SSL packet. This is a client hello packet. And this packet is going from the client's hardware address to the NATing router device, which we can see here is a Cisco device. The source IP address is 192.168.1.71. The destination is a 54.225.235.210. If we look down at the packet below, this is the packet after it's gone through the NATing router, and we have a source address now of 130.57.1.71. Now the target IP address has not changed, but the source and the destination MAC address has changed. In this particular case, this communication is using PAT, port address translation. So we can look inside of the TCP header before it goes through the PAT box, and we can see that it's got source port 26840. When we look at it after it's gone through the box, it has source port number 6312. Well, what about a proxy box? Now, a proxy box is different than a network address translation box. It's definitely different than a switch and a router. But proxy services may be bundled in with firewall services. Let's take a look at this scenario. We have a proxy box in the center that has a firewall process, and our client on the left-hand side is using IP address 10.57.0.1. The target that it wants to go to is the Wireshark.org blog, so it's blog.wireshark.org, and this is the IP address that that resolves to. Now, when we are using proxy services, you'll actually have two totally separate TCP connections. Our client here will actually make a TCP connection to the proxy box, and then the proxy box will make an entirely different connection to the target to ask the information we request for on our behalf. The proxy box itself has an IP address so it's addressable, and when the client makes its request, it would say something like, I'm looking for HTTP colon slash slash, and then it would ask for blog.wireshark.org forward slash, and then whatever blog entry that they're looking for. So the client would actually make the get request, if it's a HTTP proxy setup here, where they'd say get, and then they would do the full URL of the desired target. Let's look at this process. First, we have the client going down again through the TCP IP stack, the network interface card driver, and in this case, we have MAC address A, just a symbolic MAC address. And the traffic will be sent to the network interface card of the proxy box. But notice that if you look down here, I've designated this as TCP connection number one, 
it's coming from the client's MAC address and going to the proxy box internal MAC address. It's going from the client's IP address and a dynamic port number, and it's going to the proxy box's internal IP address and port 8001. That's the port number that we have set up on our proxy box for this type of communication. Of course, the client has got to be configured to understand the IP address and the port number of the proxy box. That's one of the local settings at the client. Once the request comes in here, that HTTP proxy box will understand the internal IP address that you're talking directly to that proxy box, but when it sets up the proxy connection, it will use an outside address in this example. So when we look at a packet on the other side of a proxy box, we would see, and I've listed this, this as TCP connection number two, it would come from the proxy box MAC address to the MAC address of the next router along the path or the target if it were local. It is not in this particular case. The IP addressing would come from the proxy box external IP address and a dynamic port number. Now the proxy box is acting as a client. And then it would go to the IP address of the target system, our blog.wireshark.org, on port number 80 in this case because that's the port number that the blog resides on. So how do we compare a switch, a router, a NAT box, a PAT box, and a proxy against the OSI model. Here's our picture of the OSI model, layers 1 through 7 from the bottom up. Now we already have talked about the fact that switches reside by default on layer 2. Now of course there are some switches that can do routing functions, which means they offer layer 3 services but a basic switch is a layer two device. It forwards based on the MAC address. Routers and network address translation devices are layer three devices. So these are network layer devices. Proxies are considered a layer four device. They begin at the transport layer and go above that. When you are completely setting up a brand new TCP connection on behalf of a client, then you're working with layer four and above. But what about port address translation devices? You'll notice that I don't have them on the list here, and that's because they're a little bit strange. Remember that the port address translation devices play around with the port number information in the packets. And so some people could argue that those are layer four devices. But in actuality, they are layer three devices, even though they are allowed to look up to layer four and use the layer four port numbers, they're not using those port numbers to connect it to services. They're using those to basically demultiplex packets that come in to make sure that they go back to, to the proper host. So I would argue that port address translation boxes are actually layer three devices.